Hello, and welcome to this webinar presented by Schroeder's Personal Wealth. I'm David Ryder, and I'll be hosting today's event in which we're looking at the outlook for the global economy and the implications for income investments. In a few minutes, the Head of Income Solutions at Schroeder's Investment Management, Rupert Rucker, will be joining us to provide an in-depth look at income investments. First, though, our Head of Investment Specialists is here to give us an update on the global economy. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, David, and good morning to everybody. And it's, I'm delighted to be here this morning to talk to you all. So obviously last year was a very difficult year for markets in terms of the economy. There was lots going on. I think it's pretty safe to say, though, that things are starting to look a little bit more encouraging moving forward. So not only do we have the rollout of the vaccine that I'll talk a bit more about in a few moments, but also we have a new president in the United States in the terms of Joe Biden. And obviously closer to home, we have now completed Brexit at long last. So I think there's quite a lot to actually be positive about looking forward this year. I'd just like to start off, though, if I may, today by just looking at the, the situation around COVID. And COVID continues to have a massive effect on economies around the world. And you can just see some statistics here. Um, 110 million plus people have been infected. Um, 85 million plus now have recovered and over two and a half million plus deaths. So that number of deaths is horrendous and has obviously had a big impact from a personal perspective, but also it's had a huge impact in terms of economies and economy, economies around the world have really been placed into what I've been calling induced comas. And now as the news flow starts to improve, um, cases do seem to be falling. Hospital admissions seem to be coming down. Um, and I think things are starting to improve from an economic perspective, which is really, really positive. Um, and we're really excited about what's in store for this year. And just touching upon the vaccine, I've just put up a slide there that shows really that um, the rollout of the vaccines is starting to accelerate. And leading the way in that rollout is Israel. Um, the slide says there that um, almost 40% of the population is vaccinated. It's probably now closer to 50% of the population has actually now been vaccinated. So um, they are doing very, very well. They have managed to get the vaccine to around 2% of their population per day. So an excellent result as far as that is concerned. And if you look um, at the UK, I think the UK is actually doing really well as well. Um, we're managing to vaccinate 0.6% of the population per day and closely followed there by the USA there at 0.4%. And why is this so important? Well, the vaccine is probably the best fiscal stimulus that we have available to us we need to get the economies moving again. We need to come out of lockdown. And, and I'm sure that people listening this morning will have seen Boris Johnson announce last night our roadmap um, out of lockdown and what that actually means in terms of the UK. And obviously they're starting with the schools very, very shortly. So what is the potential downside here? Well, the potential downside, I suppose, is that people don't take up the offer of the vaccine. And this is a survey that was carried out by Ipsos Moi, the pollsters, and they've surveyed a lot of people around the world that if they were offered the prospect of the vaccine, would they take that up? And they've categorised it as strongly agree, somewhat agree, disagree and strongly disagree there. And what you can see is at the top of the table there, China, 80% of the population in China would either strongly agree or somewhat agree 
to take the vaccine if they were offered the prospect of a vaccine. So that is particularly encouraging in terms of the Chinese economy is concerned. If we look closer to home there, it's a similar picture for the United Kingdom. You can see there um, the UK is around about 77 percent in terms of people who will take the vaccine. And actually, from some of the other data that I've been seeing and, and receiving, I think that that number is actually higher than that. So, again, that's a real positive in terms of opening up the economies and, and actually moving forward. On the not so positive side, I think we have to focus in towards the bottom of the table there and particularly France. And what you can see there, if asked the same question, only 40 percent of the French population would actually take up the offer of a vaccine. So um, that may well change because the French are developing their own vaccine and um, they may actually look to use that more widely and people might be more favorable but that is a risk particularly if that is um, played out across the rest of the european union if people are not so willing to take the vaccine that does have implications from an economic perspective certainly across the european region so the chart in front of you now goes all the way back to 2001 and it just shows you the rate of GDP, gross domestic product, the rate that an economy will actually grow at. And what you can see there is that in the early part of the of this decade, you can see that from 2001 to 2007, the economy actually grew pretty strongly predominantly driven by China and the rest of the emerging markets there. 2008 comes along and we get the financial crisis and we still manage to get global GDP growth just just around about 2.6 percent there. The recession that actually followed that was actually in 2009 and you can see on the chart there um, the economy globally shrank by around about 2%. So a pretty large fall, but not as large as the fall that we have seen in 2020. So if you fast forward to the right hand side of the slide there, you can see in 2020, the global economy there actually shrank by around about 4%. Um, and if we remember sort of the end of March, early April, if you look at the UK by way of a proxy, the UK economy shrank by around about 20 percent in the first quarter of 2020. So um, a really steep, sharp fall in terms of global economic growth there. And why was that? Well, really, it was because. We were placed into lockdowns, certain industries couldn't operate, um, and the economy was, as I've sort of alluded to, placed into an induced coma. The talk at the moment has all been around what is the shape of the economic recovery going to look like? And we very much think that we're going to see a nice bounce back this year. And we've got a forecast there, as you can see from the slide of 5.2 percent for global growth this year again driven largely by china and the rest of the emerging markets there and that will moderate slightly out into um 2022 but some good growth coming through and on the back of that we are positive for what we call riskier assets in our portfolios particularly overseas equities uh, and that is where we have our overweight position at the moment. So I think we could see some really good growth come through uh, in terms of the economies over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And just looking at that in a little bit more detail, what we can actually see there is the shape of that um, economic downturn and that subsequent recovery. And if you look there, the bottom line there, the sort of the um, yellowy line, 
the very bottom one, you can see that the UK has actually been hit the hardest there. Um, so not only did we have to contend with COVID, we, we also had to contend with the prospects of Brexit as well. And you can remember all the shenanigans and the negotiations right up to the wire at the end of 2020 before we eventually came up with a deal. You can also see from this chart as well that most of the major economies will be back at pre-COVID levels. And that's represented by the 100 number on the chart by the end of 2021. The UK is probably going to take to the end of 2022, maybe slightly longer to get back to those pre-COVID levels. So we're watching that quite closely. And at the moment, we have a neutral positioning on the UK market within our portfolios. Why are we positive? Well, we look at lots of economic indicators and this is just one of the indicators that we look at. This is what we call a forward looking indicator and it's a survey of various areas of the markets. It's called the purchasing managers indices. And the magical number here is 50. Anything above 50 points to expansion and anything below 50 normally indicates a recession. And you can sort of see the light blue shading on the chart around 2008, 2009. And you can see that recession I was talking about on one of the previous slides there. Again, fast forward to 2020, and you can see just how sharp and severe that recession has actually been. What we're starting to see, though, with this leading indicator is that places like the US are actually starting to grow again. And I think one of the main reasons for that is that the US has not necessarily had the, the lockdowns that we've had within Europe. Um, and again, you can see there that Europe is just marginally um, below that 50 line. But the encouraging point is that though this survey data is actually picking up, which gives us confidence in terms of those economic forecasts that I was just talking about a few moments ago. And what we've had to do as society is increase our borrowing. And you can see here um, a chart that just compares our borrowing to the levels that we saw in um, the financial crisis of 2009, 2010. So the deficit at the moment is around about 220 billion pounds. So that's a huge number in terms of the UK. But contrast that back to the financial crisis, and that number was actually around 160 billion. So you can see how much bigger the borrowing has had to be in order to keep the economies afloat. And the normal sort of range there, indicated by the, the light grey, the green, is around about the 40 billion area. And remember, most economies will run at a deficit, um, and that's quite normal because normally that's sustainable um, for them to actually meet that and actually meet those interest rate costs. And what this next chart actually shows us is how government debt has actually risen substantially over the period. So you can see all the way along to 2008 and the financial crisis, it was running at around about that 40% of GDP. The financial crisis comes along and we see a big uptick in the level of debt increasing there. And that has continued and has accelerated even further as we've had obviously the impact of COVID on the economy there. And that is okay when we have interest rates at the levels that they are around the globe. So currently we have interest rates around the globe as we, we all know at basically zero. However, if interest rates start to rise, 
it becomes a problem for not just the UK government, but governments around the globe, because most governments are in a similar position about how they actually fund their cost of debt. And that can have a potential impact on the government bond market. And it, in simplistic terms, it can mean that the price of bonds can actually start to fall away. And over time, the income that is available will actually rise because remember, these move in an opposite direction. And Rupert's going to talk in a few moments a bit more about the prospects for um, income and, and getting income returns in the markets that we find ourselves in today. I can't really talk to you this morning without just touching very briefly on the upcoming budget. And um, Chancellor Sunak there has literally been in the job for 12 months. So um, a real baptism of fire, I would suggest, in terms of what he's actually been going through. He cannot, though, save every job. That is not possible. And what he has put in place has been very, very good. So the furlough scheme, which has been extended again. But there's lots of talk in the press about how we are going to pay for this level of debt that we have built up in society. So will there be increases um, in taxation in the upcoming budget? So there's certainly lots of rumours around rising capital gains tax allowance, uh, sorry, rising capital gains tax rates, maybe cuts in the um, annual allowance. Will the allowance be tapered? Um, will it be a bit like income tax where you get above a certain amount and you start to lose your allowance? And also the tax free allowances that we all enjoy, will they be increased in line with inflation? We will wait and see upon that one. But again, this is all a way of actually raising additional money, which is what we have to do moving forward. To counter that, I think there still could be quite a lot of spending because obviously there's a lot of industries that are very weak out there. And obviously um, the hospitality industry is the big one as far as that is concerned. There's also been rumours about the introduction of a wealth tax, particularly on property. Although I have to say, um, I think that's not going to be particularly popular uh, with um, wealthy individuals. And whether that will happen or not, we will wait to see moving forward. The big question, though, I think for the markets at the moment is, will inflation return? And what you can see there is the sort of the four major areas, the US, the Eurozone, the UK and Japan. And inflation has been hit by pandemic because we haven't been going out filling our cars up, for example. So the price of oil um, at one stage actually turned negative, which was a technicality. But for a very short term, it did turn negative. But it's now risen to around about 60, 65 dollars a barrel again. So in normal environments, that would potentially be inflationary. But at the moment, inflation um, is low, but there is the prospect that it could return. And what we have here is a chart that really demonstrates that. And I think we have a two way pool particularly. So we have the cost of core goods, which is um, the sort of the dark line on the bottom of the chart there that is actually picking up. And that is really because of the price of oil increasing. And let's think about this, because when goods are made, when they are shipped, they use oil to make those goods. They use them to heat the factories. They use them to transport the goods around the globe, basically. On the opposite side of the coin, we have the service sector that has been shut down for a considerable period of time in reality. And that is artificially keeping down inflation. So when you sort of put the two together, you end up with a two way pull that probably means we are going to see some inflation return. But in the short term, we don't think that's going to be particularly huge. And it's probably going to be out to 2022 
before we really see inflation start to pick up. And, and I think that's a, a, a topic that Rupert will mention when he talks about income in a few moments. So in order to sum up, um, lockdowns cause economic pauses. They have been extremely uncomfortable for society, as we all know. Um, I'm here this morning talking to you from my home. Um, I've not been out of my home really for in terms of work for the last 12 months. Well, there's a dramatic note on which to end. Um, Rupert, if you wouldn't mind coming on screen now, I don't know if uh, the if you viewers at home have been having sound problems there uh, or ex seeing the sound problems that might be happening, but uh, we're going to look into that and see what we can do. Uh, I would encourage you also to send in questions that you have uh, relating to income investments in the global economy. Uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, but we are going to go through them in order of relevance to this subject first. Um, now, I think uh, that will set us up nicely. Um, so I'm going to come back to uh, Steve when uh, he comes back and joins us. But in the meantime, we're able to uh, turn again to the head of uh, investment solutions at Schroeder's Investment Management, Rupert Racker. David, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, next 20 minutes, I, I just wanted to to really follow on from, from Steve's introduction um, and try and, and frame the, the environment that we've got at the moment in terms of actually how we invest and, and how we actually get income. Now, the best way to do that is to look backwards to enable us to look forwards. Um, and here we have in front of us uh, a certificate that I found in my father's files, which takes us back to 1986. And I'm sure there'll be a, a nice smile on a lot of your faces as you think of those days and you think of investing in similar certificates, because here we are in 1986, uh, he was paid 8.75% per annum for five years. Uh, and remember this money was risk-free and it was tax-free. Uh, inflation at the time was three, 0.4%. So in reality, he was receiving a very, very good income, a real income for taking no risk at all, for having no education. Uh, and it, it lasted for five years. Happy days. I mean, that, that really doesn't get any better. Unfortunately, uh, th that has, has not persisted. So um, we're in a very different environment. And I think we, we need to understand that and we need to learn from it. And reflect that in the kind of decisions we make. So in the past, that there was really nothing we needed to do, that there was very little risk we needed to take with our money and, and we could get decent income. Now, all of that changed actually quite a few years ago. So, so back in the last recession in, in 2008, when central banks were forced to reduce interest rates to very low levels. Um, and from then on, really, we haven't been able to get those sources of income um, without taking any risks. So bank deposits have not been yielding really anything, and nor of government bonds. Um, what, what I'm going to, I'm afraid, promote for the future is this is unlikely to change. Um, and it, it's something that if we haven't got used to, we're going to have to get used to, um, that there are lots of solutions that, that are still available for us to make decent returns, but they will enable us, they will mean for all of us to have to think differently if we're not already. And if we can, um, then there, there are lots of solutions and that's the sort of thing I'm gonna talk about. Now, to, to frame this, um, let me go back and, and to, to enable us to go forward. Uh, when I go back to those generations where those, those high yields were available, so the, the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even up to 2008, um, actually, surrounding that was a huge amount of uncertainty year on year. If you remember, um, if you had a mortgage, actually year on year, you had no idea where, where that interest rate would, would end up. It was difficult to fix and there was a lot of stress and anxiety about where interest rates were going and they were extremely volatile up and down the whole time. Um, and, th and then that, that uncertainty from an investment point of view was quite difficult to cope with. What I'm going to suggest is we still have huge amounts of uncertainty in life and that will never go away, either from, from the weather or, or politically or with our own personal lives. 
But actually, from where we look in terms of, of the investment environment, the, the future looks a lot more stable than the past did. And that's because we think some things are quite predictable or inescapable looking forward over the next 10 years. And that's good and bad. The good thing is it enables us to plan a little bit more. Uh, the bad thing is we're in this situation where, where those risk-free income opportunities just simply not available. Now, we, we think it's predictable that there will be very low GDP growth or much lower GDP growth in the future. And largely, that's based on demographics. That's why we think it's predictable. It's just realistic that when we look around the world, the populations are in decline. Um, and when you get declining populations, particularly in, in the larger economies around the world, that does have an impact on GDP growth because people really make economies. And if that those people are declining and they're less economic, um, it, it's very difficult to actually get the kind of growth levels that we did in the past. So, so we think that that's relatively predictable over the long term. It's very, very difficult to predict these things uh, year to year. And on that basis, we do think there will be limited inflationary pressure. Um, and the consequence of that is, is interest rates will remain low. And again, they, they will fluctuate. So I, I think Steve was talking about inflation just at the moment. I think it is predictable inflation is going to pick up from the very, very low levels that we have in the next one or two years. But we think it will peak at lower levels than in the past. and That won't have such an influence on interest rates. There, there are other um, areas that we think are quite predictable that, that are also influencing that, that this lower GDP growth. Uh, and those are areas that have become much more common just in the past couple of years. So the environmental concerns that they're only just starting and, and going to have a huge impact on, on where capital is spent, on, on economies going forward. Um, that there is going to have to be quite a big answer from a political point of view on, on the kind of stagnating real income situation that, that has invoked populism. And we saw that with the the. American administration um, under Trump. We've seen it in, in other uh, governments, and, and we think that that's something that, that may continue. Um, we think that government finances will, because of all that debt that they, they've had to, to gain over the last couple of years, uh, there will be less room for maneuver there. But there are going to be lots of technology challenges in the labor market. Now, all, all of this is quite predictable. Um, but it does have implications for the way that we invest. That's what I'm here to talk about. And on that basis, that we think there are a couple of two or three things to, to really uh, understand. One is that, that just investing in, in the market and in indexes is not going to be good enough to deliver the kind of objectives that, that you want from your investments. They're not going to be dynamic enough. There is going to have to be more choice and solutions looked at in order to deliver your objectives. Uh, we, we do think that, that the kind of environmental concerns, the sustainability, all of that area will have an impact on, on, in, in terms of investments. But the main thing is, and this is the big consideration, that lots, lots more diversification is going to be needed in, in your investments in order to deliver those returns. So um, the, 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 what I'd like you to go away with is, is thinking that we need to take more risks with our money, not necessarily more risk, because more risk gives us actually more diversification. And, and the great thing looking forward is there are so many more opportunities to invest in areas of the world and asset classes that simply weren't available in, in, in 1986. Now, I just wanted to go back to, to the, these interest rates because it, it is fundamental in, in terms of, of how we have to look going forward. And I want to th actually put the past into context so that we understand that the past as we know it, 1986, which we think was normal, when actually you look in context of, the, of history, it was actually incredibly abnormal. So in the UK, we can go back actually to the 1790s to look at interest rates. 
And, and from the 1790s all the way up to the 1970s, actually interest rates were relatively low, that uh, they weren't a big function in, in the economy. It was actually th this really that the decades from the, the late 60s to the 70s, 80s, 90s, when inflation took off around the world, that interest rates were, were increased to very high levels to combat that inflation. And we got that period of, of very high real interest rates which we think because it's in our lifetime is normal. It's simply not. What we've actually started to come back to is more normality. So that the last few years where we have negative rates is, is much lower than in history. So that there might be a, a retraction back to maybe positive rates, but they're going to be nowhere near the levels that we had in the past. So what, what we think is very predictable is you're not going to get any income from your bank deposits and you're not going to get income from safe areas, you're going to have to put your capital at risk. Now, that is a huge behavioral change than, than we think of from the past. So what, what do we do about it? That, that this is the, the whole crux of, of, of my presentation this morning. What we can't do, just to reiterate, is use the, the traditional asset classes from the past. We cannot use government bonds, gilt, particularly in the UK, to give us income, that they're at zero. And we think that's likely to change, that they may uh, go up a little bit in terms of interest rates, but really not, not to any decent levels that, that will, will give us the kind of income that, that we want from our investments. So we're gonna have to look elsewhere. What, what about dividends? Uh, well, di dividends, very traditional and a popular source of income in, in the UK. They have been impacted significantly by cuts, particularly in the UK, due to the recession. And yes, that they will start to re return, but not for a couple of years, again, particularly in the UK. And that, that's all to allow companies to, to restore their profits. However, you know, when, when we compare the, the alternatives and we simply look at equities versus traditional fixed income, equities certainly do provide a good source of income. But what I'm going to explain to you is that that's not enough. And, and if we looked in the past at, at these very narrow asset classes, which to us were, were, were normal, equities, fixed income, bank deposits, um, actually, we need to look much, much wider, as, I, as I've been inferring, to get our objectives in, in the future. Um, and, and that's really what why I'm, I'm bringing up this slide to, to explain that a, a multi-asset income solution is, is really the, the way forward. Uh, and when I say multi-asset, that, that means looking across all these new investment areas that are opening up. So we, we've got areas like emerging markets. Now, em emerging markets um, used to be quite a narrow asset class, just a, a few, few countries. Um, we now can invest in the huge market that is China, we can invest in India. Uh, we can invest in lots of other markets that, that are labeled emerging markets, but actually are, are growing very strongly um, and are big and they're liquid and they're providing the, the kind of diversity uh, that have only really been available in the last two or three years. Uh, we can invest in areas like securitized debt, convertible bonds. Uh, we can invest in, in many areas of, of the property world uh, and across the world that we weren't able to in the past. And this is only increasing and giving us more opportunities to blend in investment solutions and income solutions to deliver you the, the, the kind of objectives that not, not in, in absolute terms you could get in the past, but which would still seem reasonable. And I wanted to give you an example of this but I want to end up explaining what the trade-off is. So here's an example of, of how we can use those different asset classes to still deliver a yield of about 4%. Now, that may not seem a lot compared to the past, you know, going back to 1986, but in today's terms of zero interest rates, it's very attractive. Now, the, the, the compromise and that this is really the, the, the significance of today and, and going forward is to get that 4%, we really can't use any safe assets. When I say safe assets, it's where your risk is, your capital is safe or protected by governments. To, to get that 4% these days, we have to go into asset classes where your money is at risk. So it's in equities, 
it's in high yield bonds, it's in emerging markets. It is then spread across these areas um, in order to get that 4%, but there is no there, there is no way around this. We can't keep your money safe day to day. It's in the markets. Now, you know, actually, as long as you have a much longer time horizon, it's something I'll reiterate at the end of my presentation, um, that that money will give you those returns and your capital will be, will be restored. But that's very different to putting your money on deposit or if, even investing in, in government bonds. So that's what we can do from a, a diversified multi-asset asset select point of view. In fixed income, it, it's much more constrained. Um, clearly, the benefit of fixed income is much less volatility with your money. Um, but in fixed income, if, if you if you want to make that choice in terms of, of, of that lower volatility, then the, the income is so much lower. So even taking quite a lot of risk in, in fixed income at the moment, we can only get about one and a half percent. So these are your choices. They're available to you and they have to be commensurate with the, the kind of personal uh, attitude you have to, to your capital. Um, but it, it's pretty clear that if you invest your money risk free, there are no returns available. In order to get returns, you've got to put your money into the market. And, and that, it, it, I'm afraid, means that, that your money will be more volatile in, in terms of, of that capital return. But then the returns are still there if, if you're prepared to do that. So in summary, what's needed looking forward, which is different than the past, particularly around 1986, where I started? Well, much more time is needed. In 1986, um, you didn't really need to think about your investment. Um, you just bought that certificate, you waited for five years, and you knew you'd get your money back, and you knew you'd get that, that income. These days, we have to put our money in the markets, and that means we need to take time to allow that money to work. For example, if you had been frightened by the market volatility back in March 2020 and taken your money out, uh, you would have missed out on one of the biggest market rallies that, that we've seen in history. Um, as long as you keep your money in the markets, keep it working, that can compensate for the prices going up and down. Remember, they're just prices until you actually sell those investments. Lesson two is capital that is seeking returns. It needs to be invested in the markets. Um, there's all sorts of diversification now available to reduce that risk but it needs to go in the markets. Lesson three is increasingly looking at how sustainable those investments are, is, are important. Lesson four is we need to reduce the concentration in, in traditional equity and bond markets. We need to look elsewhere to get the kind of investment objectives that we all deserve. And, and actually, those opportunities are emerging. So, as I said, uh, and I'll end this, you know, China is now emerging as one of the biggest economies in, in, in the world, has been for some time, but we can invest in it. And, and that that's really encouraging. David, I'll, I'll leave it there. Give us some time for, for questions and I really hope that helps everyone in, in terms of looking forward, not looking back. That's terrific. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to be coming back to you and asking you to expand a little more on the phrase you used that uh, we need to take more um, more risks, but not more risk. So uh, do be ready for that one. Uh, Steve, uh, I'm, I'm hoping you can uh, come back because uh, you were cut off in your prime. Um, I'd quite like if you wouldn't mind uh, if you would just complete the uh, summary points you were talking about before the gremlins took hold. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, sorry about that, everybody. I was just explaining how I've been locked in my home from a work perspective for the last 12 months, relying on technology. And of course, the technology failed, which is um, always the way, isn't it? So, um, yeah, just like to sum up, really, and everything I was talking about a few moments ago. Lockdowns cause economic pause. Um, and we've seen that around the world um, as economies have been locked down it's pretty obvious that people are not going to be able to move around. They're not going to be able to spend their money. Um, but that demand has not gone away. It has been delayed. It has not been destroyed. 
I mean, um, since um, Boris Johnson mentioned last night our roadmap out of lockdown, um, I've seen reports this morning, for example, that um, all the holiday company websites have been inundated with people now trying to book holidays. Um, maybe a little bit premature, maybe, but we will wait and see as far as that one's concerned. But it, it is an example of, of the demand that is actually still out there. But the vaccines are absolutely the game changer. They are the best fiscal stimulus that we have available to us. The governments around the world have done a great job in terms of um, being very organised and very um, proactive in cutting interest rates to zero very quickly and printing money, basically. And I think that's the big difference over 2008, really. This time around, they have reacted very quickly and really done everything they could straight away instead of in 2008, maybe we tried interest rate reductions and we cut a bit more. Then we put some more money in the economy and a bit more. This time around, they have been very, very um, on the front foot as far as that is concerned. So we do think that economic growth is going to pick up. As I said, we forecast um, global GDP growth of over 5% this year, moderating to um, 4% um, into 2022. And obviously on the back of that, um, profits will pick up. And it's interesting listening to Rupert there and some of the things he was saying when I talk about investments, I always talk about three things. One is sentiment. And absolutely, sort of at the end of March last year, the markets were absolutely driven by sentiment. But for us, what is key is to look through that sentiment and focus on two other key areas. One being the fundamentals. And that is, can companies increase their profits and can they increase their um, income, i.e. the dividends they pay? and also the valuations of those companies. And I think that is also key uh, moving forward. And in this type of environment, you don't want to be heavily overweight in government bonds, the debt of governments. It is more the riskier investments, the riskier type investments, as we call them, um, equities, international equities in particular, and to a a lesser extent, but still some extent, corporate bonds, which is the debt of the individual companies there, will actually benefit from that. But the key message is we very much agree that interest rates are going to remain low for longer. Um, and I can remember those heady days um, that Rupert was talking about and the national savings issues um, and investing in those um, on behalf of clients in, in those days as well. So to leave you with one point, really, we are optimistic about the returns for this year. But I urge people who are nervous um, to stay with it, to ride out what we've always called the roller coaster of emotions. And what is absolutely critical in markets like we find ourselves in is diversification, not to put everything in one basket. And that is absolutely how we manage portfolios on behalf of our clients. We spread the risk, we spread um, the funds through different types of investments for you. So I'll pause there, David, and uh, hand back to you for some questions. Yeah, um, the, there's a few things I want to ask. I'm gonna come back to one of the points you were just closing on there, if I may, Steve, uh, because while we might have a mixed view of the future of gilts, so government bonds in the UK or treasuries, government bonds in the US, we still hold them in some of our portfolios, don't we? Um, we do. There are reasons for that. Perhaps you could uh, expand. Yeah, no, absolutely. And portfolio management is really about two things. It's about balancing the risk with potential returns. And the starting point for us when we build a portfolio is to sit down with clients on an individual basis and really understand what clients are looking to achieve and what level of risk they are looking to take with any investment they may wish to make. That then determines the appropriate mix of asset classes for a particular client. And we spend an awful lot of time and doing lots of modeling of different scenarios with different mixes of asset classes. And the reason we spend so much time doing that 
is that that drives approximately 80% of any given investment return over the medium to the longer term. The other 20% comes from two key areas, what we call our tactical positioning. So that is flexing the percentages around those asset classes that I was just describing, maybe going overweight or underweight as we call it, and getting the right managers or the right strategies in order to um, populate those different areas that we are investing in on behalf of clients. Cool, thank you very much. I'm going to pick up on the point now on risk, uh, Rupert, if I may, and also skip to a particular slide that had a lot going on in it. And I think there's there's more scope to discuss. You talked about uh, taking more risks, but not more risk. So that's if you wouldn't mind using a couple of examples on this slide and also explaining what GMAI stands for. Oh, yes. Th thanks. So GMI is just an example that, that um, from, from a Schroeder's perspective of, of a fund that we run called Global Multi-Asset Income, which combines a lot of these asset classes. So it's just showing that when you when you bring these asset classes together, um, actually, you can reduce the risk of some of them um, and, and get a, a quite an optimal portfolio. Um, and that's the whole point of diversification. Um, but but I think that just to sort of think laterally a, a little bit for, from your question um, and, and thinking here, sitting in the UK as sterling investors, you know, what, what's really changed over, over the last 12 months is the cost of getting th this diversification. So uh, 12 months ago, if I was to invest in, in, in US dollars, um, and I wanted to hedge that, which I would have wanted to do back into, into pounds, it would have cost me about 2%. Um, and that would have almost um, diminished completely the, the whole point of going in, into those US dollar investments. Now, that, that was a real shame because in, in US dollars, you've got the biggest asset classes in the world by miles. Um, you've got the whole of the US economy and then lots and lots of fixed income it, it priced in US dollars from everywhere in the world. So to, to actually not be able to invest there because of the cost was was really unfortunate. That has completely changed, and, and I don't think it's, it, it's going to going to go back again in the last twelve months because interest rates in the U.S. have now gone to zero, as they have in the U.K., as they have everywhere else, um, and, and the cost of that hedging is based on those interest rate differentials. So that cost is gone. So we can now invest anywhere in the world um, in U.S. dollars without paying those costs and then but in, in, in then achieve that diversification and and all of those those potential returns so that that's fantastic and then that you know that that's the whole point uh, about this diversification it is not paying too much for it to enable it to give you the, the, the benefits that you wanted cool um i'm going to follow up with another question if i may rupert um you talked about uh, the longer term investment period being required now and obviously when you said you will get your money back obviously that no guarantees are available in uh, investments uh, money's always at risk investments can go down as well as up we have to say that um <clears throat> how long do you think the investment horizon should be no i, I think reasonably it's got to be five years at, at least uh, it depends on your situation in life um but in terms of your your risk to your capital, at least five years. Um, that that means that in the meantime you, you could also always take income that that's being distributed from from that capital. Um, but that five year period would hopefully compensate you with any kind of market volatility that that comes our way. Um, but as you say, we can't be precise on this, but at least five years. So, you know, th this is a long term in investment that, that you need to take now. Uh, and that will enable you to then get all of the opportunities that, that, that the world offers. OK, thank you, uh, Steve. Um, you talked a lot about the best stimulus at the moment being the vaccines playing devil's advocate what if the vaccines don't work yeah absolutely great question because obviously that is the big concern out there i think um we, we do a lot of modeling around that and at the moment we have a very low probability that that is not going to be the case and actually i think we've got a sort of a probability of only around about somewhere in the low single digits there that the vaccines won't actually work and a lot of the data 
that we are seeing and there was some out yesterday really was really really encouraging about how um just after one jab it was high in in, in the high 80 percentages um that people were actually protected from this awful illness so um if vaccines didn't work what would happen is that the economy would you know potentially um go into deflation so it's not a scenario that we are predicting it is something that it, that is out there um and of course there are other risks as well um so you have the prospect of trade wars as well with china for example that could be reignited they've sort of gone away they've gone into the background but they are still there um you know i, I suppose the views on china now because a lot of people are saying that this is where it started rightly or wrongly um what does this mean for globalization so it's not just as simple to say you know what happens if the vaccine doesn't work what's going to happen to the economy there are other risks out there as well but to to answer your question directly um we, we do we do believe and the data is certainly indicating that vaccines will work and um, all the scientific data, and I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, is sort of saying that even if we get these other strains that everybody is talking about, um, it's a bit like the flu. There is a different strain of flu every year and the vaccine is adopted to this. And let's not underestimate how wonderful the scientific community has been in order to get these vaccines to us in just over 12 months or less than 12 months, basically. Good point. Um, Rupert, if I can come back to you, there's a lot of downward pressure on bond yields. So when the demand for and price of a bond goes up, the yield goes down uh, because the coupon that generally speaking, the coupon that a bond pays is fixed. So you have a, a sort of a seesaw effect on the, the price and the yield. With governments issuing lots of bonds, that increases supply, which pushes the prices down in theory. And with inflation rising, that can also bring interest rates up in theory, which would attract money to savings accounts, which have lower risk, again, reducing demand. So with potentially supply increasing and demand falling for bonds, what would you say is the outlook for bonds at the moment and therefore the yields that they generate? I, th I think central banks, particularly the Fed, but also the Bank of England have been pretty clear in terms of the roadmap. So even though it, they expect some of the short term inflation uh, data to be on the increase as we come out of, of, of these lockdowns, um, that's not going to um, mean that they start to increase interest rates automatically. So they will allow uh, a period of time to let that inflation work its way through um, before even looking at it. Um, because as Steve was inferring in his presentation, um, that the damage that could be caused not only to the government finances, but, but to any kind of economic recovery by increasing interest rates is, is, is significant. Um, so what we're talking about is, is what the market does. So in, in terms of, of governments, I don't think they're going to do an awful lot. Uh, what will the market do? And um, that there certainly will be some more volatility in bond prices uh, as these inflation numbers start to come out. That's that's inevitable. That's what markets do. Um, but, you know, we, we think and, and I go back to my slide about the inescapable truths that, that this will all calm down because we do think in the long term, looking forward as we get out of the, the, the crisis over the next two, three years and beyond, um, inflation will be muted by this lower growth prospects that we think are baked into to the global economy um so uh, again it, it's a it's the, the point would be to, to to hang on to your investments you know don't be panicked by the, the seesaws in markets um uh because that they're inevitable that they, they always happen maintain your investments that that's the way that you can compound the, the kind of returns that, that you want um and you know get, get the, the income that you, you that you need Thank you. Steve, uh, looking at the uh, things we've discussed today, the outlook for the future for various asset classes, what about the implications this has for SPW's allocation of assets? And you've already touched on it to an extent by indicating the importance of strategic asset allocation, which is long term. 
um, and then the, the more shorter term nuances. But bearing those points in mind, what are the implications for the SPW portfolios and investments? Yeah, great question, actually, because one of the things that we do on an annual basis is to review that long term mix of asset classes. So we've literally just completed that review. And what we will have seen is that we have increased further our exposure to international markets, markets predominantly at the expense of the UK market, because we believe that is where potential future growth is actually going to be coming from moving forward. So um, I think that's a, a really good question. And it's something that we do at least on an annual basis. And we have the option if we need to, to do that more frequently. But I think the point to make as well is that that is the long term asset allocation. So um, we wouldn't want to be changing that every week, or every month. We would flex that um, around the edges, as I sort of said previously, by using what we call our tactical positioning. So um, we are overweight international equities at the moment because we do believe that is where the growth is going to come from moving forward. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Rupert, last word, if I may ask you. Um, as a brief summary of the attitude investors have to have at the moment, uh, how would you summarize that? Well, I, I, th I think re remain positive. So, so as long as you understand if you want something from your investments that they have to be in the markets, then th there are amazing opportunities now open. Um, so, you know, actually be interested, educate yourselves, be enthusiastic, uh, that there's lots of opportunities going forward. Um, but th just don't panic uh, um, because inevitably that there's a lot of un uncertainty in markets and there will be volatility as well. So. You know, think about March 2020 and look what happened. Um, think about other periods of, of market volatility and, and think what happens. So don't be panicked into, into selling investments if they, if they still make sense for you personally. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that the more you can educate yourself, the more you can be interested, uh, then obviously the, the more care you're going to have ab about your investments. And, and th there's so much more information now available. It's, it's, it's a great time to be investing, much better than I think than 1986, even though, of course, it was much more certain in 1986. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, both Steve and Rupert, for your time today. Really appreciate it. I will be writing a piece that summarises the discussion we've had today, and you'll be able to find that at SPW dot com forward slash wealth hyphen lens. And finally, thank you for taking the time to watch this webinar and for your questions. For now, please look after yourself, stay well, and we hope to have your company again on the next webinar. Goodbye for now.